sometimes go over to her and cuddle with her to make myself feel better. Well, now when I went out, I wasn't on my own. I had somebody who really looked after me. She has like a, a natural ability to kind of cuddle with you to, to soothe or comfort. I'd have a lot more company and watching the dogs and their skills is just incredible. Once they have love and care from their caregiver, like that's, that's what makes a dog. They're just, you know, therapeutic in a way because when I come home from college, I I cannot wait to see them. I feel if we didn't have a dog, it kind of wouldn't make us a whole. Like, they're just they're so loyal and compassionate. Like, they're, they never have a bad day, so if you're ever having a bad day, they're always going to make you feel better. Come with me on my journey as I explore how dogs have won the title of our best friend. Ever since I was a little girl, I've always wanted a dog to be a part of my life. There is something so happy, playful, loving and loyal about this animal that made me fall in love with them. They are so much more than just a pet. They look after us as much as we look after them. I went to the Irish Guide Dog Centre in Cork and spoke with Owen Slattery, an Irish guide dog trainer, who told me how dogs helping humans and becoming guide dogs came about. The company Talk Guide Dogs originated around or shortly after the First World War, where mustard gas was used and which, while it didn't necessarily uh, kill people, although it did as well, but it caused a lot of people to lose their sight. So around that time people throughout the world were recognising that dogs could be used for these otherwise quite active and able and physically capable people. And there was one woman in particular, an American Swiss lady, who recognised, Dorothy Eustace was her name, she recognised that there should be a four-wheel training uh, school or system to enable these uh, able-bodied uh, uh, veterans to be able to use a dog for mobility. So she set up one of the world's first schools and that was in Switzerland. They're trying to ignore distractions like other dogs, cats, uh, the burger left on the footpath. Um, and in that sense, the dog has to work quite closely with the clients. It has to know what's expected of them, know how the clients are able to generalise or work around a specific situation, partly by repeatedly doing those situations. And in that regard, it takes up to about 12 months for a dog really to get working perfectly. While I was down at the guide dog centre, I met Patrick Costigan. He was training with his new guide dog after his current dog just retired. I was on a white stick for the first 18 months and very effective. But when you go out on your own with a guide, with a mobility cane, that's it, literally you're on your own. And you have to find out all the different obstacles and where they are. Um, so I remember asking my NCBI resource worker, could I get a, a, a retired guide dog? Because I know I have some sight, even though I'm still registered blind. I do have some sight, but 80% of us who are registered blind have some sight. And she said, Pat, don't be gobshite. Of course you're registered blind, you can get a guide dog. And I swear, it hit me like that. I thought, Christ, I could get a life back here. First guy I had was called Quandro, Q-U-A-N-D-R-O. And his mum was a German Shepherd, and his dad was a Golden Retriever. And there was speculation that at least one of the uncles was a horse, because he's huge. And he was the tallest working guide dog in Dublin for the full 10 years we were together. Every woman in the country wanted to talk to you. I met the 18 year old son at the time who would ask me to, can I take your dog for a walk in harness please? And I say no, for obvious reasons. But, um, so we worked brilliantly together. I, you cannot believe how my, my life totally changed and blossomed because well, now when I went out, I wasn't on my own. I had somebody who really looked after me, who really had me, had my goodness, my welfare in their mind. And there's nothing like a dog. I mean, it is unconditional love you get from a dog. And because you spend 
so much time together. We worked together officially for nine years and nine months to the day. He's gotten old. He's nearly 12. He's in good health, but he's tired, like all of us. He just gets a bit worn out, you know? But uh, I had, they have a succession planning system whereby after about the year of nine, they start looking at you and your dog and seeing what, how well the dog is working and whether you want a replacement and if so, what dog they might have in stock to replace them. And um, I was incredibly fortunate because they had this guy Parker with Quandro. He was getting older and slowing down and I didn't notice it because I adore the animal. I would, I'd prefer to get rid of my wife than my guide dog and my wife would prefer to get rid of me than a guide dog because we, we adore that animal. He's just, he's part of the family, literally part of the family. Um, we're only just starting off a journey. Well, I finish up uh, four more sleeps and I take him home. Imagine that, four more sleeps and I get to take him home. It's just incredible. These guys, they've just opened up my life again. There are very few ways in life that you can profoundly change <coughs> somebody's life. Now, guide dogs profoundly changed my life. And not only that, the, the, I, what I see as the hero of all this system are the puppy raisers. They used to be called puppy walkers, but they're now called puppy raisers. These are men and women who are not paid, who take on a bundle of fluff at about I don't know, eight or 10 weeks old. They keep it for a year, where they teach him to only, to, he or her, to peer, poo and command, to socialize, they do everything. And then at the end of a year, when he's a big dog, they give it away, they give it back to guide dogs, and it goes into the early training unit at that stage. And they train the dog to see if it's going to be a guide dog or an assistance dog or whatever. And then eventually goes on to uh, advanced training and then from there it goes to matching with someone like me. As well as helping the blind, dogs have also been trained as assistant dogs to help people with developmental disorders such as autism because of their easygoing and calming nature. I spoke with April McLaughlin about how their assistant dog Quinta helps her son Tide. My dog's name is Quinta. The dog's name is Quinta. Quinta! Quinta! Don't put her down. <laughs> Quinta! Um, the first time we heard about it was actually in the States before we moved over here. Um, Tide was about three years old, so he'd only been diagnosed for a year. And you had to be five to get one. And uh, so we hadn't really put too much thought into it. When he returned four, we had moved over here and then we hadn't really heard anything. And then a couple of years later, we had heard the Irish dog, the guy, the Irish guy dogs were doing it as well. He was getting older and he was still running away. He still had no danger awareness. So, you know, outings were very, very difficult. So, we, I, he was in horse therapy. And we noticed his speech and stuff had um, improved when he was on the horse. And so we thought, let's try and get him an animal. We looked at the fact that he was still, you know, kind of um, escaping and stuff like that, and so we thought we'd go down the assistant dog <laughs> route. So it's nice to be able to go out, you know, and um, you left so we right. get out and do things and stuff like that. Yeah, I think he, he's learned left and right um, because we have to say it when we walk with her. So he's picked up on those sort of things. Um, just. Certain areas his speech has come on. I think for us, she's just kind of a, a calming tool as well. You know, she's just, when someone's not feeling well, they like to go lay on the couch where she's right next to them and they'll just there and rub her while, while they're laying down. She has like a, a natural ability to kind of cuddle with you to, to soothe or comfort. So it's really nice. Sometimes go over to her and cuddle with her to make yourself feel better. Like Quinta. Uh, like when she's wearing her jacket, you can notice a difference in her. Uh, because like we went to the beach for the first time with her and we had no idea what to expect because there's like all these different smells and sounds and people and all sorts of distractions. But we knew she had to work to get Ty onto the beach and then she could play and be a dog, but getting back from the beach we weren't quite sure about. Um, so we walked onto the beach. She was, uh, Ty was in his harness attached to her. She did great, everything. She ignored all these other, you know, seaweed and stuff on the sides. She did really well. And then we let her off and let her be a dog for, you know, a good 15, 20 minutes. 
and we called her back. She came right back. She put the jacket back on. She went right back to work. I was so impressed. I mean, I was in tears. I actually blogged about it when we got home, but uh, I, it's, you can see there is a difference when she puts on the jacket. It's like she even walks slower. I mean, she has a very different demeanor. She, she, it's, she knows she's in uniform. I uh, just uh, like to um, rub her um, like uh, when she's lying down and when her tummy's up sometimes because uh, because she really likes it and she really likes having her chin scratch. Yeah. <laughs> Best dog in the world. Yes. Dogs Helping Humans is not a recent occurrence. Their amazing abilities have been helping us for thousands and thousands of years. The Grey Wolf is the descendant of all modern dogs and they've certainly come a long way. Up to 30,000 years ago, during Paleolithic times, humans and wolves had a few things in common. They both lived in groups, were intelligent and they wanted to survive, competing for the same food. Wolves began coming around human camps in search of extra food when they were hungry. We began to observe their abilities. They hunted efficiently, their sense of danger and their quick reactions. The wolves young were born amongst us. The wilder pups would leave and the tamest pups would stay. From here an alliance between human and wolves began. They helped us to survive. The dogs are kind of prior, they're the main thing for hunting as they're, since the smell is, is, is 40 times greater than the human scent, they can smell other animals and flush them out. Whereas if I had to go and hunt the animals by myself, it'd be by sight because the human scent isn't strong enough to smell other animals to flush the birds out like the dogs do. Very agile and obedient and it's very easily trained the dogs. If I was out hunting by myself without my dogs, it would be a lot more lonely, as if the dogs were with me. I'd have a lot more company and watching the dogs and their skills is just incredible. The, each dog may be the same breed, but they have such different personalities and the skills are outstanding. Without the dogs, I probably wouldn't be hunting as well as we do, as they're the main, the main character in the role. As we began to travel, so did the wolves. They began to change due to the environment. In the south, they began to have shorter coats due to the heat. Thousands of years of environment change and selective breeding has given us all the hundreds of different breeds of modern dog. It is fantastic how we have all these amazing breeds. However, this has unfortunately led to the overbreeding of dogs, puppy farms, and the demand for purebreds. This causes a lot of dogs to end up with no homes. There is amazing animal welfare charities and shelters across the country, such as Limerick Animal Welfare, that take in homeless, abused animals, nursing them back to health and finding them their forever happy homes. Dogs give us so much love and we should give it back. It is important to adopt, don't shop, which I will without a doubt be doing in the future. I spoke with my friend Aoife Galan, who told me how her rescue dog is nothing less than a bought dog. My dog's name is Jessie and we got her from Limerick Animal Welfare there about seven or eight years ago now. And um, she's a Border Collie Terrier cross, we think. They weren't really sure, but because she's a rescue dog doesn't mean that she's different to any other dog. Generally, Dogs that do come out of sanctuaries like Limerick Animal Welfare, they do tend to have more love for the owners because they were neglected in the past. So like they are just as loving and caring as purebred breeds. I'd come home, she'd always know that like she'd get like a tummy rub or something, so she'd always lie on her back. So the dog I had before Jessie was actually a pure breed. Uh, she was a collie, what can we call her Lassie? Um, but I see no difference between Lassie and Jessie. They're both very loving dogs. Like, there's no real difference between a purebred and a rescue dog. It's so much nicer to 
like give back to these dogs and like there are so many dogs out there that we don't know about that are being mistreated or that don't have a home that are just left on the side of the road but just because probably that their family couldn't care for them or just didn't have the time for them so I, I believe like once a dog has a good home that's all they need once they have love and care from their caregiver like that's that's what makes a dog um, it's not whether it's a pure breed or a dog that's coming from a welfare sanctuary. Um, it's all about the love and attention you give your dog. A lot of dogs that are lucky to have their forever homes often get pampered within an inch of their life. There is a range of professions revolving around the health and welfare of dogs, like vets, groomers and doggy daycare. I met my family dog groomer, Karen O'Brien, and she told me why she wanted to work with dogs. I to work with dogs then because it kind of seemed like an outlet that because I loved, loved them so much and they were so like kind of caring that at least I could kind of give something back to them. So I think with dog women then you can inform like customers that come in with dogs and they've never had an animal before of how to take care and look after their coat and how to like treat any illnesses, different customers that come into us on a daily basis they tend to rely on us for information and just like general sort of like comforting like in regards to their dogs. So like you get really toast to them and people do ring us up like for their birthdays or if they have passed on like we'd get to know of it or the vets would ring us because we'd be so close to them. For me because we've always had dogs I don't know what kind of not having a dog in the house is like. So if I feel if we didn't have a dog, it kind of wouldn't make us a whole. Um, and I do find that they're, well, people say they're good for immune systems, but I just think they're really good for just bringing children out of themselves and that they're good, like if so, you can't talk to somebody else, at least you can always talk to the dogs, they don't talk back to you. So, and they're good listeners. And like, they're just, they're so loyal and compassionate, like they're, they never have a bad day, so if you're ever having a bad day, they're always going to make you feel better, because they're never going to be upset, so, because they're just so well looked after. <laughs> Funny story with him, actually, I told my mother I was going for milk and I came back with a German Shepherd, um, so that was it's from the shop. <laughs> we hope to give dogs forever homes and that we will be their lifelong friend. It is sad if a time comes when we may no longer be able to look after them. Rachel Breen brought me to see the heartwarming friendship between Tommy and Rusty. So we have Rusty the Terrier since uh, August 2011. He um, belonged to an old man that lived down the road from us, uh, Tommy. And poor Tommy has no immediate family and he lost his sight because he got blood behind his eyes. So him and Rusty were the best of pals. But of course he didn't trust anyone else to look after the dog because he knows we have four other dogs so he asked us to look after him for three weeks and that was seven years ago. <laughs> so we still have him now and he's 18 years old now actually. Um, so my dad takes him into the Woodlands nursing home in Dundrum every so often to, to meet Tommy. Such a positive impact on Tommy himself but also the other, the other residents in the nursing home. Like, he not only jumps up onto Tommy and he'd be licking his face and everything, he goes around all the other the other residents as well and he'd be, you know, looking for a biscuit off them or for different things like that. And even like I thought it was so amazing when we brought Rusty in again to see Tommy and Tommy was nuzzling into him and you know it was like that that was his that was his child, you know, Rusty was his child. And I just I I just think dogs are just absolutely amazing because I have four other colleagues myself and you know, one of my friends who do doesn't really like dogs in particular likes our dogs because she said they're not, they're more like people. You know, they all have their own total individual character and, you know, one is whingy and he talks loads and one is, you know, lazy and they all have total different personalities. Um, I just, like, my dogs are 100% part of my family. Like, when my dog Glenn passed away, he, he lived to be 15 years and it was actually like, a death of the family you know it really was and it was like a brother dying and even at that you know some people don't get on with their brothers as well as I got on with my Glenn you know my dog it's just incredible they just they are like my, my siblings you know they're, they've got totally different personalities to each other and they're just you know therapeutic in a way because when I come home from college I cannot wait to see them and the reason why I, I you know I don't 
study at home for my exams is because I'd be just run off in the middle of the floor with them. You know, I'd be so I'd be so distracted. And it's just absolutely incredible that there's a loyalty that I see in my dogs and Tommy's dog as well, Rusty, that I see in you know no other animals, not my turtle, not my horse, not my donkey. Like even after these seven years when we take, you know, when my dad wants to take Rusty in to see Tommy, all he used to say is, are you going to see Tommy? And Rusty still, at 18 years of age, leaps off the ground and is so excited to see him. And when, when we bring him in, you know, you know that he still remembers that Tommy was his owner and he starts licking his face and there's just something magic about it. Oh, oh great. He makes you feel great? Yeah. And do you like when he comes to visit? Yeah. Why? Huh? Why? Oh, I like him to come, yeah. You like him to come? Yeah. He makes you feel happy? Yeah. Let's face it, I always knew dogs were amazing. Hearing the stories of others' relationship with these animals, it is clear that the domestication of dogs has led to much more than just a pet. It has led to our best friend. They helped us hunt and survive, transport goods, protect livestock, guard our homes, catch criminals. They have become our sporting heroes and have saved us from drowning and the cold. They guide us to safety. They calm us in stressful situations and help us in times of need. These amazing animals have found their place into our homes, hearts and families. One thing that's for sure, my dogs never fail to put a smile on my face. This is Fizzy's first walk out. Yes.